Good evening, everyone. My name is Des McNulty. I'm Deputy Director of Policy Scotland here at the University of Glasgow. And we're very fortunate tonight to have um, an event with Michael Russell, MSP, entitled Scotland in a Post-Brexit and Post-Pandemic World. Before I ask the principal to introduce Michael Russell, I just wanted to highlight a couple of um, housekeeping issues. Um, the view that you will get will, will, will eventually settle down to, to, to just being the, the speakers. Uh, so apologies for the, the multiple images you've got on your, on your screen at, at the minute. Everyone is muted apart from, from, from the speakers. If you want to ask questions, please do so on the chat function. Uh, and those will be taken up as we, we move through the, the, the event. But without any more ado, can I pass over to the principal, Sir Anton Muscatelli, to introduce Michael Russell. Well, thank you very much, Des, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation entitled Scotland in a post-Brexit and post-pandemic world. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you and indeed welcome our distinguished speaker to the university. Now, I know that uh, Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell will be very familiar to many of you, but for those of you who are uh, yet unfamiliar with our speaker, here's a brief summary of his career. Uh, Michael was first elected as an MSP in 1999, and after a brief hiatus was returned as a member for the South of Scotland in 2007. He has been the constituency member for the picturesque Argyll and Butte constituency since 2011. It's a seat, in fact, he will vacate when he steps back from frontline politics at next year's Scottish Parliament elections. Uh, prior to Hollywood, Michael was a television producer and director and the author of several books. He was also chief executive of the SNP from 1994 to 1999. And as a Scottish government minister, Michael held an environment brief before serving as uh, the Minister for Culture, External Affairs and the Constitution. In December 2009, he was appointed Cabinet Secretary for Education. That's a post he held through to 2014. And then in September 2016, after the Brexit referendum, he was appointed Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe, and he subsequently became Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, Europe and External Affairs, a role which has uh, certainly kept him fairly busy ever since, as the Brexit negotiations and, and other issues that he'll discuss today have uh, come to the fore. Um, as Chair of the First Minister's Standing Council in Europe, I I've had the pleasure to work closely with uh, the cabinet secretary since 2016. Brought up in Troon, Ayrshire, uh, Michael was educated at Edinburgh University. Now I know what you're all thinking, but let's not hold that against him, especially as Michael is a very long-standing friend to all of us here at the University of Glasgow. Indeed, in, in 2015, the university appointed Michael as a honorary professor in Scottish culture and governance with links to both the colleges of social sciences and the College of Arts. Uh, a position that Michael temporarily had to step away with so that from because he had to concentrate, of course, on his new ministerial responsibilities. And it's really these responsibilities that form the substance of his remarks uh, and his conversation this evening. Uh, and tonight's event will be chaired by our very own uh, Professor Murray Pittick, Bradley Professor and Pro Vice Principal here at the University. And, and as Des said, there'll be time for questions, uh, hopefully after the conversation. Uh, despite the limitations imposed on us by the pandemic, as a university, we're absolutely determined to continue to provide leading thinkers and policymakers with a platform to discuss the most pressing issues of the day. And, and like me, I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing Michael's perspective on the current state of the UK-EU negotiations, the likelihood of a deal or not emerging before the transition period. But Brexit is only one of the topics under discussion. I know that Michael also intends to speak around uh, to, to the Scottish government's evolving response to the pandemic and indeed the economic recovery to come and indeed issues around the constitution, of course. So uh, I promise to be a thought provoking and lively session. Uh, I am really grateful to Michael for joining us at what is an extremely busy time. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank colleagues at Policy Scotland for organizing tonight's lecture and to Murray Pittick for agreeing to act as chair but most of all, I would like to thank Michael Russell for his time. Mike, we're delighted to welcome you back to the university and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'll hand over back to Murray, thank you. Thank you very much, Principal. Uh, so the uh, cabinet secretary will speak uh, first for a, on, on the topics that the principal's outlined. And then I will ask a couple of questions to get the ball rolling. But by that time, 
we will have a sense of any questions which have come through the chat and then those will be we will open up to uh those who've asked questions through the chat in the next 20 minutes or 20 minutes or so and have a final round up at the uh, at the end if anyone has come back through the chat at that point so do put in questions through the chat as you proceed um cabinet secretary the floor is yours well thank you very much uh Murray and, and thank you, Anton, thank you, Des, and, and thank you, the University of Glasgow. Um, as you indicated, I have a, a live connection with the university and I'm looking forward to making it even more live uh, when I step away from my current role next uh, May. I, I was very happy to accept this invitation. I'm always happy to speak in Glasgow, I'm always happy to be questioned by Murray. I think I'm appearing in front of three parliamentary committees this week. I, I tend to be known by my colleagues as a minister for committees because I appear in front of so many of them. So I, I also treat Murray's interrogation of me as a sort of limbering up exercise this evening to make sure that I'm up to speaking both to our COVID committee, to our Europe committee, and indeed to the House of Commons uh, Scottish Affairs Select Committee on, on Wednesday. I want to corral what I'm going to say into three broad headings, which I know have been advertised, but just to remind people of what they are. The first of them is inevitably the, the pandemic. The Scottish Government's response to it, where we stand now, where things may go. The second of them is the issue of Brexit, particularly the internal market bill and the question of negotiations. And, and, and we are, every Monday morning now, we, we start off the week by saying we are at a particularly crucial week in the EU-UK negotiations. Every week has been crucial. Uh, it just hasn't produced any result. And I'll try and give you my own view of where I think things are and where things may go. And I have to warn you, uh, you know, viewers, look away now. It is not a present prospect uh, when you look at what will arise out of the current situation. Uh, and then I'll finish up by talking about uh, independence in Scotland and the world, what I think is the natural outcome of the other things that I'm talking about. Um, let me start on the pandemic with a, a hopeful and positive note. I know there's much speculation about what may happen this week as we're now in the weekly review of, of the pandemic and the First Minister will make a statement after Cabinet tomorrow. But the pandemic will come to an end. Uh, you know, that is absolutely certain. And we will find ourselves in the position of, of moving forward, not backwards into what we have known, but forwards into what is presently called the new normal. And therefore, in all the difficulties and all the strains upon us, and all the hard decisions that have to be made, and I've taken responsibility during the pandemic for emergency uh, legislation and for the regulations. Uh, in all those circumstances, there is hope uh, and that hope will be fulfilled. But it has been a, a period of great strain upon every one of us. I don't think there will be a single person who's listening to this or, or watching this who will not have felt that strain in some way or another. And it is important to acknowledge that uh, we've gone through and are going through something uh, quite unprecedented, unknown by us. Uh, we could not have known this experience before. And when we come out of it, we're going to have to use that in order to try and rebuild in a way that provides a better future for ourselves and for those who come after us. So that is the positive that we should focus on. And there is, in my view, too much time spent focusing on, on, on the political negatives within this situation. I, some people see me on a weekly basis or so sitting in the Scottish Parliament chamber during First Minister's questions. And I look at the First Minister, I look at the Health Secretary and I look at what they are having to go through. And I don't believe I could do that because I believe that the uh, political polarization at present in this, particularly in the Scottish Parliament, is wounding and unhelpful to many people. There should be the strongest scrutiny of the, the, the work of the government in trying to save individuals and individual lives in this process. But there should also be an understanding of how difficult that is, uh, the time and effort that, are going, is, that is going into it, and the need for there to be as much solidarity as possible as a nation in defeating the virus. And I hope that that message gets through from time to time. It's not, we don't live in a normal time and we shouldn't be living in a normal political time. And, and that is a first and strong message I would put out on the pandemic. It, it is foolish to think that in some sense we are simply back into a, a normal political exchange on the pandemic. People are dying and we have a situation which unless there is 
action taken will result in more people dying. And there is no doubt about that. Uh, taking to, a side, or to one side the, the fantasies that exist very often about uh, from people who, who don't want to accept that reality. It is the job of every single politician, whether they're in Scotland or England or anywhere else, to see what they can contribute to making sure that as a society we come through this. And I, I think that is a message that we don't discuss often enough. It is not trying to avoid scrutiny. It, I don't think I've ever seen a situation in which there is as much scrutiny, but it is about recognizing our responsibilities as individuals and as politicians and our responsibilities to the people we represent. I know within my own constituency, which I'm speaking from, there is tremendous hardship. You know, the one sector of our economy, the tourism sector and economy has been devastated by this because essentially there has been no tourist season. And you know, we have endeavored to do everything we can to support that within the confines of the Devol settlement. But uh, it is important to recognize that uh, we will require to do much, much more and to do it for a period of time, even if there is a vaccine successfully introduced either at the very end of this year or early part of next year, we will need to focus on getting ourselves through that and then rebuilding. Now, I don't want to dwell upon some of the negativities of it. Let's dwell on some of the positives out of this. We will learn new things. I was saying before this started, as we were discussing before the event started amongst ourselves, I think some of the rebuilding is going to be radical and different. But we are focusing much more on localism. We are looking to communities to uh, make decisions about how they wish to move forward. And we will have to recast some of the ways in which we operate, for example, in terms of care homes and care for our elderly, which is a particularly grievous and difficult lesson that has, I, I think, been learned, but has been an awful and painful experience, as, as the First Minister has indicated. And we will have to make sure, as we do rebuild, that we put the, our trust in those who are rebuilding. And that will be a key issue. And it will arise, I'm sure, early in an, in an early order at next year's Scottish Parliament election. And there'll be a question of who do we trust to rebuild in Scotland? Do we trust the Scottish Government to take the lead role in that? Or do we look outside Scotland for that to happen? And that will be something that we have to consider. We have to look at the ways we do it, and we have to make sure that we are prioritizing the right things. And we are trying to do it collectively and as much as a community as we can in what is a divided society. So uh, one other reflection on the pandemic I just want to make, and I, I, it is not a league table. I think another shocking thing, and I think it was Jason Leach who pointed this out on one occasion, another shocking thing is an attempt to have a, some sort of league table to say people have done well and done badly. It, it is not that. But I think we do have to reflect that one of the distinguishing marks in Scotland has been a desire to engage people in decision making. And I think that it will remain vital going forward. And I think it does also have implications for where we are and for our democracy. And I think we have to look at this and say, how do we maintain a continued good communication and good flow of information and good reaction to how people feel and how do we continue to support people uh, in, as we, they make decisions going forward? That brings me into the second area of communal experience, uh, and that is the experience we're going through of Brexit. I uh, have had responsibility for that particular area in the Scottish Government since almost since the UK Brexit referendum in 2016. It is, I would have found it then incredible had you said to me when we established the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, which was meant to oversee this process for the devolved administrations into the UK, that some four and a half years on, there would be no resolution. But there is no resolution. All we now know is the outcome will be unsatisfactory, not just to Scotland, which voted against it, but in virtually all the criteria we could apply. Uh, it will be damaging. There will be an increase in food prices. There will be shortages. There will be economic dislocation. Uh, Anton is fully familiar with the figures on this. He, as a member of the Standing Council, he's seen the papers that we have published on this. Uh, this is going to continue to be an area of difficulty, uncertainty, and uncertainty going forward for a considerable period of time. Let me just take one example. 
which is in the movement of goods. Even if there is a deal, it will be what I've called a low deal. It will not allow the free, for example, services will be severely affected, but even in the movement of goods, there will be some inspection of goods and there will be a considerably more bureaucracy in the movement of goods than there has been if you're a member of the single market, the customs union. Um, that will inevitably mean uh, an increase in prices, but it will also mean that there will have to be new procedures put in place, and they are not even a glimpse in the eye at the present moment. If you talk to logistics experts, they say in 18 months we might have a new system in operation, but during that 18 months things will cost more and things will be more difficult until we settle down into what will be a much more complex uh, system than we have presently. Now, we have to trade that against whether there will be advantages, whether this new system will over a period of time produce new opportunities. There is no such evidence. Uh, all it will produce is additional cost and uncertainty. And we know extraordinarily that the number of businesses who are prepared for that at the moment is falling, not rising. And that is because of the COVID pandemic. So it was very foolish and very destructive to continue with this period of transition and not to extend it. But that is what the UK government have chosen to do. When we come down to knowing whether or not there will be a deal or the low deal, we are also unable to make any prediction as of this moment. I veer between thinking we might get a deal and we might not get a deal. I think the, politi the politics of this are such that in any rational world there would be one, but at the present moment there appears to be a limited amount of rationality to spare. So uh, it, it, it is impossible to tell whether this week we will close, the gaps will be closed on the areas, big areas of difference, level playing field and fishing, or, or whether they will remain open. If they remain open, uh, then we will have no deal and that will be particularly damaging. And just to add to that mix, we have the Internal Market Bill, which will weaken the ability of the devolved administrations to respond in those circumstances, and particularly if there were to be uh, a, a, a um, no deal, and if there were to be disadvantageous and bad trade deals, then the ability of Scotland and Wales, and to some extent Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland is a special place, uh, would to, to defend itself and to continue to set high standards and continue to defend those high standards would be very difficult. And uh, at the present moment, well, this week, the House of Lords will consider the report stage of the Internal Market Bill. The provisions in it on international, that breach international law are well known. The provisions in it that underline devolution haven't been discussed so much, but I think it is possible, at least, that the UK government will be defeated on those provisions and that therefore the House of Commons will be asked to reinstate those provisions. And if they do reinstate the provisions, I suspect there will be a fairly lengthy period of dispute between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. But if the House of Commons in the end succeeds in reinstating them, then as I have made clear, I think then the question of how we as a government and the Welsh as a government may act in terms of whether there's a legal challenge to be made will have to, will have to come to the fore. The great tragedy of this is that this uh, is completely unnecessary. The system of common frameworks, which we've established over the last three years, uh, could substitute perfectly easily. It is, the Internal Markets Bill is a, is a solution looking for a problem. The frameworks are there to smooth over any difficulties, and we don't anticipate many, any difficulties exist in internal relationships. And all of them, either in final or provisional form, will be in place by the end of the year. This is a, a, an unnecessary argument. It's a destructive argument, and it's one that we certainly do not intend to step away from, even at this stage, though it does take very considerable bandwidth and effort uh, at a time when that should be devoted elsewhere. And that brings me to, to the thing which, uh, according to the, my political opponents, should, uh, effort should not be spent on, and that is the question of whether we should pursue a second independence referendum. I, uh, in March this year, I wrote to Michael Gove uh, and indicated that we would not proceed uh, during the, uh, that stage of the pandemic. The reasons were very practical. We felt that the staff effort and time, official effort and time, political effort and time would have to be devoted entirely to the issue of the pandemic. And so it turned out to be. I noticed today in, in something I was reading that I think more than 80% of the officials who worked with me on 
issues to do with the referendum, to do with independence, to do with the constitution, moved to other jobs instantly and were involved in the pandemic. And many of those have not come back from those jobs as yet. There's still much work to be done uh, on the pandemic. But we have also uh, seen the growing pressure in Scotland, which I think is perfectly understandable, for people to have the right to choose whether they continue with the destructive nature of Brexit or whether they choose the normality of being a small country as an independent member of the EU. And I think that that uh, question will require to be answered. I think the uncertainty of not producing an answer for it adds to the damage that is being done through Brexit and um, through the UK government's actions. And I have argued for some time that I think that the, the sooner that can be done and the sooner that question can be put and the answer given, the better it would be. And I think many people now agree with that. I, I, you know, there's a lot of speculation about dates and times, but I've been quoted often in recent months by saying I see no reason why that should not take place in 2021 if there was a commitment to do so. And indeed, uh, the, the current government will offer in, in its manifesto uh, the final part of the referendum legislation. If that is endorsed by the people of Scotland, then it should be enacted uh, as soon as possible after the election and uh, the referendum should then take place. This is a normal process. I just want to stress the normality of it, not just in terms of, of, of recent history where many countries have become independent, but it is a normal process for a political party to espouse a change and to be able to ask the people whether they support that change. And if they do support that change to enact that change and to allow it to come into effect. There's nothing abnormal in this. Uh, indeed, given where we presently are, it is, would be surprising if people were not looking about for alternatives and not looking at a time when rebuilding will come onto the agenda, whether there would be a better way to run our governance and a better way for citizens to operate uh, within their country. And in those circumstances, it seems to me not only normal, but rational to say that this is something that should be done at the appropriate time in a, in a way that is a gold standard of, of democracy. And that's what we intend to do. Um, I think the hysteria with which it is greeted uh, just needs to be put in context. Uh, you know, if, if there is that much hysteria, then those who are against it clearly have something to lose. And what they have to lose should be examined. It is a perfectly reasonable proposition in terms of how it can be achieved. And those who salivate at the thought that there's some special reason why Scotland could not uh, achieve it, uh, I think they also have to be subjected to close questioning. I noticed with some amusement in recent weeks that uh, Andrew Neil, a graduate of course of Glasgow University, uh, believes that the, uh, the, the question is being pursued because uh, Scottish journalists are, not, uh, are far too sympathetic to, to the SNP and that there's not enough scrutiny. I have to say, having been a minister for the best part of 13 years, I don't feel unscrutinized, uh, far from it. So those three areas I've covered very briefly tonight, which I know Murray will now delve into, and I hope others will delve into, seem to me the, the key areas for us to, to consider at this particular moment in the country, but also to consider Scotland's relationship to the world. And let me finish on that. Um, I've spent the last four years, as I indicated, on the issue of Brexit, but I've also spent it talking to people in Europe and further afield and uh, in the last uh, period as external affairs secretary as well, making sure that Scotland's voice is heard and cause is heard. I last did that uh, over a decade ago when I was uh, external affairs minister last, and I have to say the atmosphere is very different. Scotland's not uh, an invisible country, but it is, you know, in Steinbeck's phrase, it is a cause on one. But people have woken up to that cause uh, and woken up to the fact that uh, Scotland does not regard itself as better than anybody else, uh, nor substantially different from the majority of the world, but does have uh, the right to determine its own future. And the people of Scotland have the right to determine how they are governed and, and what associations they make. And it is Brexit that has put it into the sharpest focus. I know many people talk about the pandemic as being a, a defining issue. But from my perspective, it is Brexit, and I think the polls bear this out, that has been the defining issue, because it focuses attention on the basics of democracy. And those are, by and large, global. They're not observed everywhere, but they are global, which is the right of people to choose 
and the rightful to, that, that choice to be respected. We see played out at the present moment in the United States, uh, an extraordinary scenario. Whereas uh, ex President Obama made it clear yesterday, uh, you know, the whole basis of democracy, the, the right of people to argue their case and for that case to be resolved uh, is being threatened. Um, I hope that that is not what will happen in Scotland. I think Scotland uh, has the right to be heard. And I hope that even those who do not agree with the choice accept that right. And that does mean walking onto the world stage. And it does make, mean making sure that people understand where we're coming from and who we are. And we are a small European nation in the mainstream um, uh, trying to recover from a very difficult set of circumstances which have affected all our neighbors and all the countries on the planet and trying to work out what would be best next and to do it in partnership. In partnership, yes, with our neighbors south of the border, but in partnership with a wider grouping uh, who we think have share the same values that we have and perhaps share the same hopes and aspirations. Marie, I hope that's a, a brief tour de raison. I'd be very happy to, to discuss it and to go into more depth if I can. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Well, I'll, I'll, there's some questions coming in on the chat, which I'm very conscious of, but I'll set the ball rolling in a couple of areas to start with. The first is round about the uh, Scottish government handling of the COVID pandemic and more particularly the kind of economic priorities that there will be coming out of the pandemic. And you mentioned, of course, one of the key themes, which is localism. Now, I mean, I uh, was uh, last week in discussions with, uh, with uh, Community Renewal and Tourism Trust in Ayrshire, and as is the case in Ayrshire and in other parts of Scotland, one of the key issues is the culture of local organizations and councils it often militates against cooperation on a larger scale. And clearly things like the regional, the regional uh, growth deals have helped to incentivize more cooperation when there was less likely to have that cooperation. But I'm wondering in terms of the prioritization of localism, and there's certainly many local parts of Scotland which could grow further and develop further in all kinds of areas from, uh, I think of food and drink and culture and, and tourism in particular, how will, government, how will government be able to ensure that localism doesn't collapse into local, cult, local culture and the particularities of the institution and governance that it, that it represents and expresses itself through? Yeah, I, I, I think that it's probably, you know, the, the government can't impose localism, uh, you know, and, and if the government could impose localism, it wouldn't be localism. I think what the government has to, any government has to guard against uh, is, is balkanization, uh, you know, and, and you would find uh, small parts operating in, in ways that would not be particularly productive. I think it's one of those things you have to try out and see how it works, and you have to listen to people who are doing things. I'm very conscious of the fact that it must be about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, I think, actually, in our first administration, uh, we, we believed that there was a desire for community councils to have more powers. And we did a pilot exercise in it and discovered there wasn't such a demand. There were very, very few community councils that wanted to operate in that way. So I, I don't think we should worry too much about structures to start with. What we should try and do is to see if we can build on some of the great resilience work that has taken place in communities and to strengthen that, uh, and to find ways of making sure that, for example, development trusts are enabled to do things within their area, which otherwise they might not do, and to see whether we can encourage a, a, an attitude of mind and, and, a, and, and a practice that means that communities want to hold things, you know, the 20-minute the, the you know, neighborhood where people want to have things in their own area and are prepared to take the steps to do so. I mean, I live in a you know, pretty extreme rural area. Um, during the pandemic, there's been a very active resilience group. There's been an awful lot more shopping locally. The, the local hotel has a small shop and it's been bringing things in and trying to make that work. There's been a desire to make sure that you know, we are using more local produce. And I think that type of thing is happening almost everywhere. It won't be universal. Um, it, there are interesting examples in towns and cities as well. So I think this is about developing that approach. And I, I hope the political parties will 
indicate a sympathy to it in their manifestos next year. And then we can, I hope, begin to encourage it to take place. But it will be patchy and it won't be, as I say, universal. Mm. Yes, it will, it will require some, probably some financial and oh, yes. nuts to move it along, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt, but it has to be resourced. And to be fair, there was a substantial amount of resourcing at the start of the pandemic, which worked very well. Uh, and I think there was very substantial value for money. And we should probably encourage that to happen again. And do you see, <laughs> do you see uh, universities and higher education having a significant role to play in the development of local missions? Yes, and, and you know, localism is also beneficial in terms of, 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 a, of a green new start uh, because we're discouraging people from um, over much transport. And I think the universities, you know, you know Murray, that I was, a, when I was education secretary, was an, a, a, an active, encourage, gave active encouragement to online learning, so much so that I was criticized for so doing as if I was trying to undermine the, the basis of, of higher education in Scotland. I think now we recognize that whilst there is a strong place for the institution and for where the institution is, there's also a very strong place for, for distance learning and for hubs to be established. And I think that the you know, imagination is now really required in this. I, I'm, I've been a big supporter for a long time uh, of uh, Glasgow University's campus at the Creighton, for example. Um, I think that you know, the University of the Highlands and Islands has been I think an important innovation, I mean, sometimes it, it doesn't seem to have quite fulfilled its potential of being as distributed as it should have been. And I think in the, the new principle, I hope, will, will push that issue. But having distributed institutions uh, with uh, you know, very porous institutions seems to me the way forward. And that doesn't just apply to higher education. I think it's going to apply to lots of things. And uh on a, I've got a, a question that I think covers the areas that you raised in the internal markets bill and also the, the process towards any potential future independence referendum. I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, you know, people often say a referendum is a choice between change and the status quo. But given the polling evidence that's emerged over the weekend, where it looks as if, uh, admittedly, this is the first time this has been polled, that three quarters of uh, those living in Scotland uh, fear restrictions on devolution in the event of a continuing Conservative administration in Westminster, and two-thirds think the internal market bill changes should be put to a vote uh, but because of the restrictions they already place, potentially in the devolution settlement. I mean, do you think that realistically we are talking about a referendum as a choice between the status quo and uh, independence, or, uh, or is the status quo in the process of being so significantly undermined that there's an additional case even to be made, even to defend it. I think it was I think it was Michel Barnier who, who pointed out that there was no status quo left. I mean, you know, the 2014 referendum was uh, you know the status quo, what you had, what you knew, or a leap in the dark. Uh, you know, I, I thought a leap in the dark was worth it. Some people didn't, um, but in, in actual fact, that that st status quo has gone. Uh, you know, we do not know what Brexit is going to, a Brexit Britain will look like. We, we may fear, but we don't know what a Brexit Britain will look like, but it won't be good. Um, and that is what is one choice. And the other choice is what we do know, which is the membership of the European Union. It, it is the, the type of arrangements that we would have um, you know, with other people. And that would define our, our, our relationship with England and, and possibly Wales, but certainly with England. Uh, that would be defined by our membership of the EU. So I think I think that has changed substantially. Now, not to say that there won't be the old fear stories of, of it, of, of, uh, and there will be there. But the choice is fundamentally different. In uh, it, it well, will be fundamentally different in 2021 compared to uh, to 2014. And I think that will be of significance. There is also, I mean, I was very interested in that poll at the weekend because uh, it does seem to me that people are waking up to the fact that the internal market bill and what the intention is, is destructive. I, um, I, you know, I've been quoted before by saying that I think there are two problems in, with devolution as it is seen from Westminster. One is there is a hostility from those who understand it, but broadly an awful lot of people don't understand it. I mean, there is, you know, a, I gave evidence to the Commons Public Accounts Committee some time ago, um, uh, uh, Constitution and, and, and Public Accounts Committee. 
And I was fairly astonished by the low level of understanding of devolution. There were only two people on the committee who had actually been around when devolution was around. One was David Mundell and the other was the former Welsh Secretary. Uh, and most members had only been members from 2010, 2015, 2017 even. And there was no lived experience of devolution, no real understanding of it, and quite a confusion uh, between what devolution was and what independence was. And I think that is a problem. Uh, yes, indeed, but I think we could talk much further on that, but I think it's to be good, good now to turn to some of the questions. And uh, Lucy, could you unmute uh, people if necessary? So I've got a two, two questions which have come from um, the same question fundamentally from Madhu Satsingi and from Stephen Watson. And they're really on the internal market bill and uh, the Good Friday Agreement and its effect on US-UK relations. So uh, it's just a reflection or I think yeah. it's a reflection on, on that within the context of the incoming Biden administration. Well, I don't think there is any doubt that on the sections of the Internal Market Bill that, uh, you know, contrary to international law, the sections that affect Northern Ireland, there will be uh, not only no agreement with the United States unless they're removed, there would be no agreement with the EU unless they were removed. I mean, um, uh, my counterpart uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, Simon Covney, was very clear yesterday about that. He's been clear all along. I mean, I, you know, I've had that conversation with him myself. There can be no ratification of an agreement if those clauses are still in the bill. Now, you know, those clauses are in the bill uh, ostensibly uh, to protect uh, the UK if there was no agreement. I think that's not true, but that's why they're there. So you could find that the Johnson administration will agree to take them out if there is a deal. If it doesn't, then there will be no deal. The American situation is equally clear. Uh, and the American situation is anything that threatens a Good Friday Agreement will not be tolerated. Uh, these do threaten the Good Friday Agreement, there's no doubt about it. And those circumstances, the bill is not operable with, with the minute. Now that's one set of objections, but I, I don't want us to lose sight of the other set of objections, which is the objections uh, in terms of how the bill affects devolution. Uh, and both sets of objections are, my view, objectionable and, and, and really should not be tolerated. I would have been much happier had the bill not arrived. Uh, I refused to be involved in the period of preparation of the bill. Well, not that we knew they were preparing it, but discussing the issue because I knew where it would head. The Welsh did so and then were told nothing from January onwards until the white paper appeared. Um, and now we have a situation where this bill will, even if amended, still be very difficult to live with and we will have to take steps to challenge it, I think. So in those circumstances, the bill would be best not to be there. I think it's over optimistic of me to say that that's going to happen this week, but I still hope that better sense will prevail. It's wonderful to have a, such optimism. It uh, illuminates difficult times. Um, well, I have a question here from Ross Britton uh, who about this is about localism. And I wonder if you could speak to what you think this might mean for the local government landscape in Scotland. The 2016 SNP manifesto committed to consult on and introduce a bill that will decentralize local authority functions, budgets, and democratic oversight to local communities. Understanding this has somewhat fallen down the agenda. Do you think we'll see new vigor for such reform after 2021? Well, there have been small reforms which have been useful. For example, uh, in my own area, a variation, the Islands Bill provided a variation which allowed for more local authority representatives in smaller groupings on islands, which was the right thing to do. But I think the pandemic should force uh, a, a, an intensification, if I may use that word, of this process. And I think it's not, it's not so much about boundaries and, and responsibilities. It is about how communities make decisions, uh, uh, what the optimum size is for that. There's no one size fits all. Uh, how individuals fit into that, what structures work. So I think there is room for considering this matter again and more radically. And it's tied up with other issues. In rural Scotland, it's tied up with land reform. You know, land reform is to me, you know, still a, a something that has a considerable way to go. So it's how individuals make decisions about the communities in which they live. And I think that's a legitimate debate now going forward into next year's election and beyond. Well, on the question of decisions, uh, Brian Smith has asked that, Minister, you said that Scotland had been distinctive in a desire to involve people in decision-making around the pandemic. 
How do you believe that people have been involved in decision making around the pandemic, making it more than a wish? Well, I think that what has happened is that people have been consulted uh, at every step and informed at every step. Now, you know, I think that, that is a good step forward. Uh, one of the most astonishing things I've seen in recent months was a concerted attempt to try and stop the broadcast of um, the, the, the daily briefings. I mean, I just find it absolutely astonishing because that was a major communications exercise in which people were engaged in the process of hearing about what was happening, reacting to what was happening, being informed by what was happening, and being able to enact themselves, to do the actions themselves that were taking charge of their own lives within the pandemic. And we've got to remember that, that a, an awful lot has been voluntary. And an awful lot of that therefore has been participatory in that people have participated in taking the actions that would make a difference. Uh, now, that's not the same as, as you know, making decisions about people's own lives in communities, but there is a similarity in that. So I think that that has been helpful. Um, we probably need to do more and we will probably will need to do more. Uh, and we did take people with us to, and that's been a big feature of the First Minister's approach, and I think it's the right one, to, to, for people to understand why decisions are being made. Um, one of the constant issues has been, we need to see the evidence. People say, we need to see the evidence. I get emails from people who say, we need to see the evidence. The evidence is there. I mean, you know, we, we publish almost everything that you know, the cabinet will see is published. Uh, the daily figures are, are voluminous in actual fact. And indeed, you know, the, 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 the weekly figures on what the uh, seven day and 14 day run has been in each local authority area, uh, you can drill down even further into sub areas. I think all of that contributes to an informed uh, electorate, uh, an informed population, and a population that is able to make decisions about how they should react based on the information that, that is available. And I would encourage people, I know, you know people, people say, oh, well, I don't have time. I would encourage people to look at the information within their own area and to understand it, because that does help in deciding whether or not people should, you know, and how they react to, to the regulation. Thank you. There's, there are a couple of questions here about the independence referendum. First of all, um, there is one from Karen. Uh, given the urgency of our situation, how does the Ministry envisage that we pursue and insist on our right to choose Scotland's future following next May's elections, i.e. what is the road to referendum? And another one from you and Hunter about how important it is for the Scottish Government to garner international support in the context of the road to that referendum. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm very clear about what the, the process is. You know, I mean, independence is about the, 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 the what and the why as well as the how. And you know, sometimes politicians get absorbed in the how and don't talk enough about the what and the why enough. But I'm very clear about what the how is at the moment. We have passed in the last year, the two bills I've taken through Parliament, a franchise bill and a referendum bill, the details of a referendum. That was long overdue. The equivalent legislation existed in the UK in 2000. So we know what the franchise is. And there, you know, there's been some speculation by people that what sort of franchise it should be. We know what it is because it's established and it's a franchise based on residence, a modern inclusive franchise. We know how a referendum would be organized. But what we need is a, a final piece of legislation that sets the timetable and the question. And we know how the question should be set because that's, that's a generic issue. So um, what will happen is that we, the Scottish government will publish that final piece of legislation before the election. We'll say to the people of Scotland, this is in the programme for government, this isn't new, we published this in September, we'll say to the people of Scotland, um, that is what we intend to do amongst, you know, amongst a range of things because it, you know, you're standing for government, so there will be a, a range of things. That is what we intend to do, and we intend to do it as a priority because it's time we got this sorted. Um, and if we, if we are elected to government, either with a majority to pass it or with enough uh, friends in the parliament to pass it, uh, then if it's passed, uh, it will be enacted and there will be a referendum. Now, the, the time scale of that, I think, I go back to 2021. I noticed Ian Blackford was talking about it yesterday. It seems to me perfectly feasible to, to do it in that way. Um, and we can move forward uh, to have the certainty of that referendum and to make the decision. Um, so I, I'm clear about the how, 
the what and the why. We need to talk more about how independence will work. Uh, we need to you know, discuss some of the issues that will arise. I noticed John Major was uh, trying to drive us down the cul-de-sac of pre and post uh, um, legislative referenda. There will be all sorts of um, what I might call in inverted commas, helpful comments from, from people. I think we need a clarity of mind as the Scottish government of what we think is the right thing and we're responsible for doing it. We should get on and do it. A question here from um, Stephen Watson. Can the minister speak to the impacts of Brexit on research and innovation in Scotland, given that the head of UKRI, Ottolin Lizard, has cast further doubt for the likelihood of British researchers getting access to future European Union funding programmes? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we still don't know um, what the relationship will be to a variety of European programmes. Um, Horizon, the, 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 the success of Horizon, the um, Erasmus, we've got a range of programmes. Research-wise, we can see the effect already. You know, I don't have to tell this audience that there is already a deleterious effect in terms of the ability to be part of consortia and to apply as, as we're no longer a member, so we apply from outside. Um, I, I, I have no reason to suspect that uh, there will be a deleterious effect, the continuing deleterious effect, and there will not be the ability to make that up uh, completely elsewhere. We must stick in, however, you, you, you talked about optimism, we must stick in. We must make sure that our links, uh, academic links are uh, profound, strong, and, uh, and being cemented into place um, with all the people we work with and we want to work with. And we must make sure that, that there continues to be an acknowledgement of what we are able to do and how we can do it. It's, it'll be tough for a while and probably for a reasonable period of time. We need to get ourselves back into the EU and back within that grouping. And I feel that on in every programme and also in a whole range of activities. I noticed the, the new budget has a, a new health programme, for example, which is part research orientated and part delivery orientated. Now, health, of course, is not a, a shared European competence, but there is a very strong push after the pandemic to have that uh, within the budgetary process. It does seem a terrible shame that we're not going to be part of it. We're, we're actually not going to be in it. Another thing I was actually looking at today, uh, uh, along with my colleague, colleague Jenny Galruth, who, who, who has responsibility for uh, international development, is the funding and the funding streams that are in the new budget for international development and the way in which, for example, the Irish are working very closely on that, and we will not be able to do so. That means that some of our aid agencies and the agencies that work on development will not be able to participate in those funding streams. But then, of course, you know, there are a whole range of funding streams we don't know anything about. We don't know what replaces you know, the social fund or regional fund because we have not seen what is going to come in the shared prosperity fund, and that shared prosperity fund will get indications from the internal market bill what might be in it. But you know, it looks as if it will be under the control of the Scotland office. Uh, it, there will be no significant place for the Scottish government in it, which will lead to duplication and confusion. Now, there are a couple of questions about the universities and Brexit beyond the research area. There's one from Valerie Gold. Uh, the impact, what impact do you think Brexit will have on universities and opportunities for young people? And uh, there is, uh, a very specific one from uh, Kerry Woodhouse saying that she's hiring interns for the small animal hospital at the vet school and usually two or, th th two or, two or thirds of their applicants are from EU countries. What should they do after January the 1st? Keep trying. Uh, I, I regularly get people who come to me and say we're applying for a you know, variety of intern programs. We usually get European funding. We don't have any funding or we have funding for the last couple of years and, and we're very keen to continue keep trying form new arrangements form new associations with people find ways of sheltering under their wing uh, and keep trying uh, because these are valuable things and, and we need to continue with them and make them work the impact on universities i think we, we will have to wait and see the mix of universities will change i believe that what we've had in terms of the fee situation has been productive for Scottish universities. And we've therefore had a rich mix from Europe and elsewhere. I think that will change over a period of time. We've tried to preserve as much of it as we can, but it's not going to be possible at this stage to preserve all of it, though we can reintroduce it as an independent member and indeed would do so. Um, 
I, I am a great believer in the resilience and, and the determination of our higher education sector. I'm quite sure that it, they're going to show imagination, but it is going to be difficult for, for a considerable period of time um, because there is a, a you know, the, the, what we're used to doing, how we're used to working on the European scene and have been you know, for a long period of time is no go longer going to be exactly the same. We must I go back to this point I've made several times in answering these questions. We need to value our relationships, uh, individual, personal, uh, institutional, um, sectoral, uh, with, with people we have had partnerships with or with new partnerships and to establish those and build on those, even though it is hard to do it in the way we've done it in the past. And there's a, a question here, for, which is from Samia, what role will be given to the next generation to determine their future? And I think I'd like to link that with one from uh, Desmond Nolte, uh, which is about the, the Scottish government's been experimenting with deliberative democracy via the Citizens' Assembly take a leaf out of Ireland's book. Is there a strong case for the wider use of deliberative methods like citizens juries to advance thinking and practice as part of the process of rebuilding after COVID? And presumably if that were the case, that would involve uh, young people. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the role of young people is, is absolutely clear. We have a voting age of 16 um, and, you know, that was continued in the franchise. Uh, I thought one of the really energizing experiences during the 2014 referendum was the, the work that was done in schools, and I have the fondest memory of it. First of all, very critical, uh, there was a long period leading up to the referendum where schools were the, most, the hardest audience, and I was education secretary at the time, and then a tidal wave in, of enthusiasm and, and energy and envisioning of, of, of the future that they had, which was very important. I, um, I've been a, a very big fan of, of Citizens' Assembly and deliberative democracy, uh, but you need to learn as you go along with it. That's why we, we took a lot of lessons from Ireland, but we took some lessons from elsewhere. We established the first Citizens' Assembly, which um, went online, it became a virtual Citizens' Assembly as a result of, of the pandemic and is coming to an end now. Uh, we put in the statute, the second of them, to deal with issues of, of climate change. Uh, that has been delayed as a result of, of the pandemic, but will meet. I think we have to we have to learn how to focus that work because it's at its very best when it addresses specific issues. Um, we saw that in Ireland, uh, and they had a number of shots at it. You know, the, the first was a very scattergun approach. The, the spectacular success was on the abortion issue, uh, and as a means of reconciling views and finding a way forward in very difficult circumstances where politicians are unable to do so, it is particularly successful. You know, I mean, and there are issues that politicians are unable to take forward uh, together, and therefore a Citizens' Assembly may well be a way of doing it. I'm, I think we have, democracy is, is, is constantly changing and evolving, and we need to remember that. We, we sometimes behave as if, uh, you know, the franchise is finished, you know, it, the succession of reform bills has produced a perfect democratic system by no means we now we now have to keep looking at the way things are done and how things innovation takes place in democracy and the citizens assemblies are one way to do it lowering voted age is another way to do it there are there are initiative referenda in some places i think there are huge problems with them and i think referenda are getting a bad name in some places but there's all sorts of things that we should think about let alone you start saying to yourself what about term limits? Term limits are common in, in, in other countries. Should there be term limits in, 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 in our democracy? I think a debate about what democracy is every so often is good. We shouldn't spend all our time on it, you know, it's a, but we should have a debate about how democracy works and we should be constantly willing to renew it and to have new ideas about it. And, and you know, we should contrast that, to be honest, with those people who are still stuck on first past the post and they are stuck on first past the post because that really is the least satisfactory system. Uh, the mixed system we have in the Scottish Parliament is an interesting variation because it allows an element of proportionality. But of course, others would argue if an independent parliament should have more members, and if it has more members, then they should be elected by another system, a single transferable voter. You couldn't do that in the present system because the constituencies would be too large, but you could do it in parliament with more members. So there are a couple of questions now about the independence referendum. One of them is uh, from Jennifer Dunsmore. Given that we simply don't know what the pandemic and Brexit consequences will be, 
how can we be asked to make an informed decision on the economic and political consequences of independence? Would it not be better to wait and see what the honest trade-offs are? So it's a question about the timing of the referendum. Yeah. And another one from uh, Sergio Tavares uh, saying that he doesn't think the franchise is settled. As an EU national, I don't expect to be able to vote within the agreed remit of a referendum under section 30. I, for one, would hate it, but we're happy with compromise if it meant proceeding in a constitutionally sound way. That said, I'm not seeing Westminster agreeing with a second referendum. Hence my question, do you see it as feasible to rescind the Treaty of Union in an internationally recognized way without going through the process of uh, Section 30? I'm taking it. So I have many was... people, Murray, as you know, you get them to who write to you and say, I have noticed the missing comma in paragraph 75 of the Treaty of Union. It must be invalid. You know, I think the Treaty of Union, much as I respect it, is passed. I don't think it is possible to return to that. I think we are fading forward to quote Walt Whitman rather than looking backwards in that regard. But I have to say that you know the franchise is settled. You know um, the last referendum was held on the on the Holyrood franchise. That is the franchise that we intend to hold the next referendum on. That franchise is settled. It is based upon residence, and therefore I do not regard the franchise as up for grabs. Uh, the fact that um, you know. George Galloway regards the franchise up grabs is neither here nor there. Uh, you know, we have a franchise and that is undoubtedly uh, settled. Um, in terms of a, 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 what uh, a Jennifer calls honest trade-offs, how long do we have to wait to know uh, is one question because I think it is very clear that Brexit is not the settled will of the Scottish people, if I may use that phrase. Uh, we are more than able to say what will happen as a result of Brexit. And it is not, even if there was an economic neutrality in it, it is, in my view, not the way that Scotland should go in terms of relationships uh, with others. Um, but, you know, in, in addition to that, you know, we also, we also need some certainty about it. Uh, if we were simply to say we'll wait a few years and see what takes place, uh, we would have no certainty at all. This issue won't go away. You know, this issue just will not go away. We are being driven in a direction which we do not wish to go. The majority of people in Scotland do not wish to go. Um, we have to make a decision about that. And therefore, I don't think waiting any longer is going to make a blind difference. Now, uh, you know, we, we deliberately suspended work because we had to suspend work. This is not something that could be held in the next week or two weeks or a month or so. But we are intending to hold an election next year. And if we can successfully, as I'm sure we can, just publish a piece of legislation that makes some changes to the procedures um, so that we can do it even more safely. We are intending to hold an election next year. It seems to me reasonable that if you can hold an election, you can hold a referendum. Uh, and therefore, I think that is the, the right thing to do. States, there's a, a question on the same topic from Lewis Kinney. If the elections next year result in a pro-Indian majority but the UK government refused to grant the referendum order, what are the steps that the SNP government would take next? Is this a court matter for the courts or a matter for an official referendum? I'm not going to make an assumption that if the people of Scotland vote to have a referendum, that that can be or should be game set by UK government. Uh, you know, I, I think that it is very clear to me that the Scotland people are sovereign and therefore that referendum will take place. I'm also not going to speculate on what would happen if the UK government does not do so. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we are very clear about what we should do. We should give the people of Scotland a chance to make that choice. And if they say, that is a choice that we wish to make, that is what we ask you to do, we should go ahead and do it. And I, I think that in terms of that, because of course, uh, independence is a very big question for everyone. Alan McCulloch asks that in the year 2025, we'll be rebuilding our developing our country either via our own government or via more Westminster government. What do you, do you see as the key differences and benefits to the citizens of Scotland from actually having all powers under the control of the Scottish government? Well, not, uh, I suppose I would say knowledge and skill. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the idea of subsidiarity means decisions should be made as close as possible to home. It seems to me that there is, that, that is the right level to make those decisions. It is quite clear in poll after poll that people trust the Scottish government more than they trust the UK government. 
I think you look at the UK government's view of Scotland, and it is not one that is informed greatly by knowledge um, or, or knowledge of how things should be done. I think that it is clear to most people that the Scottish government, that level of government, is the right level to make those decisions. And that's why I think that people will choose that to happen. Um, I think there's also you know, much more cohesion in Scotland around what would be regarded as a broadly, broadly mainstream left of centre position on these matters. I, I mean, it's not by any means exclusive and there's a range of political opinion, but when you look at the prevalence of, of the common wheel of, 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 of common, a common view of how society should progress, that there is a, a more community view, then I think that those are things that would guide you to the type of recovery that we need to push forward. And if that is a type of recovery, then it should be done by a Scottish government. Uh, there's a basic issue too of, of people making decisions and choosing the people they make decisions. And it, it, with the Westminster government, no matter what you did in Scotland, and this is you know, democracy 101, uh, you know, it, no matter what vote you cast in Scotland, every single vote presently cast in Scotland for say the SNP would make no difference. To the, to the right of Westminster because of the majority elsewhere. I just think that's no longer sustainable. I think you know, when there was a much broader exception, ex acceptance of a British dimension, that was understandable. I think that dimension, we see that from, you know, from, from, from evidence over a long period of time, that dimension has diminished and the Scottish dimension has grown. And in those circumstances, it is no longer acceptable. Much more, much more specifically and immediately, there's a question from Douglas Carson uh, that it's highly desirable that trade agreement be negotiated with the EU and fishing is one of the major sticking points. Should the UK government fold on the fishing issue in order to achieve the greater good of a trade agreement? Uh, the, the thing I have learned more than anything else is I am not going to interfere in negotiations that are taking place. You know, uh, as far as I am concerned, the negotiations underway, they must be allowed to come to their conclusion. And it would not help anybody on either side were I to, to say you know, where I thought those negotiations should end up. So I can understand your desire to get me to say that, but I'm not going to, definitely not going to say it. It just, it just wouldn't be helpful. And there's a, a couple of uh, questions, with, uh, points that, that uh, Des has raised about the extent to which uh, you, you see Regional, uh, regional development and regional agency development, and also the extent to which higher education will, I mean, I don't know if Des, you want to, you, if you want to formulate those into one, uh, they want to see how extent to which higher education has a role to play in the economic redevelopment of uh, protected groups and more disadvantaged communities after the pandemic. And indeed, well, more, more than civic. Without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, I don't think there's any, any dispute between, between any of us on those matters. Uh, there is a huge role to play. I think the redefinition of what all of us have to redefine what we do, the redefinition of how both how higher education delivers and how it engages uh, will be a very positive thing. And those are key questions for it. I, I, do, I, I do notice that uh, Iona McCritchie has, has asked an interesting question. Uh, will it be a final opportunity for Scotland to escape Westminster? Uh, again, language is very important. There's, um, uh, the, the, the British ambassador to, to Dublin, or British, British minister in Dublin, um, during the Second World War, uh, in advising Churchill not to get engaged in a, in a debate, a public debate with, with de Valera, said, phrases make history here. And if you look at the, the, the phrase of, of once in a generation, you're very careful not to get engaged in that. Politicians have the absolute right to advocate solutions and, and, and make proposals. And, and the public has the absolute right to choose between those. So, you know, I, I would never say to somebody who, who I believe was profoundly wrong in political terms, as long as they espouse democracy, and I think that's the key issue, that they should not continue to put forward their point of view. Um, but, you know, eventually people would say enough is enough, you know, and, you know, I've, I've been knocking my head against the brick wall for a long time. I'm not going to do it. Um, so I, I would make no commitment to there not being you know, a, a referendum, but I would say that the people of Scotland have the right to choose, but they have the right not to choose too. And if they say to themselves, we're not going to support a party that wants that to happen, then they would not support that party. Uh, and that would you know, answer that question. Of course, you can look at that. that happened. There were two referenda in, in, far from there being a never referendum, there were only two referenda in, in Quebec. 
uh, you know, and the, the second one came very close to the interesting analysis of why it didn't succeed, partly because it was not in, as inclusive as it should have been. Um, and actually that movement, you know, certainly at present, uh, would not appear still to be that intense a political force. Um, and that's a lesson perhaps we would all learn. But I don't think that's an argument for saying, well, okay, you can have one more shot. And if you don't get that shot, that's you've done. That's not how democracy works. Okay, there's a, um, a question here uh, from uh, just, I, I, it's been, I'm moving down, moving down the, the, the scale here, a few, few coming in. So there's a question here from uh, Rhys, can you expand on ways in which the internal market bill threatens Scotland and which untruths we can watch out for from Westminster concerning this? Yes, and, and I might touch on a question from Lindsay too, which I think is interesting in terms of the, the dynamics of the devolved administration. Uh, Rhys, um, I have to admit, and you know, I do it with no great pleasure, but I, ha I have to admit that the bill is, is cleverly drafted because what the bill does is it renders pointless actions by the, the Scottish government, the Scottish parliament, indeed by a range of bodies. Um, so what you need to watch out for is what appears to be fairly innocuous approach simply to say that the, the principle of mutual recognition and non-discrimination, those are the principles that would apply. Uh, but what those actually mean when they're applied in Europe, in the, in the European single market, is a, there are a range of exceptions and ways in which they operate, which means that there's a huge variety of things happening. Whereas what the bill does is, is very uniform. It's very, it's very monochrome because it simply says that a standard set in one place has to be recognized in another place, which if everybody was, 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 was laying out the same standard um, or competing with each other to raise standards would be very interesting. But of course, if one partner wants to reduce standards, then it means that, and if that partner is much bigger than any of the others, then it means those standards set by the smaller partners are irrelevant. So uh, let me give you an example that doesn't lie in the direct powers of the Scottish government, but is very, it lies in education. And that's in the General Teaching Council, who have been very, very concerned about the bill and have lobbied extensively on it. Because Scotland, as you know, has a register of, of teachers and to be on the register, you have to have a qualification to teach. And indeed also now, if you want to be a head teacher, you have to have a qualification in headship. That is not the case in England. You do not have to have a qualification in teaching. You do not have to have a qualification in headship to be a head teacher. As a result of which, on the principle of, of, of mutual recognition and the principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination, if I am a teacher in England with no qualifications, and I arrive in Scotland and I say, hang on, I have a recognition here, the standard, I meet the standard south of the border. Then the GTC believes that there was, there is nothing they could do about it. They could say, no, you're not teaching. We're not giving you a certificate, in which case that person goes to court and gets one. So that is, and that when you apply that right across the board, then you begin to realize how insidious this is. In each level, in each area of regulation, it is that that counts. And indeed, in the House of Lords, Lord Callanan, a government minister, saying that he would expect those who were disadvantaged to be able to have redress in the court. So if you actually look, look at that, then that would mean, for example, in national health service procurement, where in Scotland we might say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to permit that to happen. A, a healthcare company coming into England would say, well, hang on, we can operate in England. Why can't we operate in Scotland? That will go to court. So that is the nature of the problem. Uh, you know, and that is, uh, that is why when Michael Gove says there is no power being re removed, he's actually wrong, there is a power being removed, it's a state aid's power. But, you know, it is, it is not a question of wholesale taking powers away, it is a question of making those powers utterly useless. And actually across a very broad spectrum, another area not in the direct power uh, of the Scottish Government you know, is building standards which are set by the government but administered by architects and, and others. They're very concerned, the, the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland is very concerned because there are various building standards in England that they don't wish to see apply in Scotland. And that, that's not even a matter of devolution. I mean, building standards in Scotland have been different from, you know, since there were building standards because you have a different climate, you've got different materials. So there are all those things that that's what to look out for. There is no power surge because the argument about power surge is there's 156, 111 figures very of powers that are at the intersection of the powers between Scotland, um, a, 
uh, in the UK and the EU. And the argument is all those are becoming Scottish powers are not. Many of them have already exercised. So you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dishonesty in that, but in what is being affected, you have to understand the detail of it. Uh, I wanted to just go back and, and make that point about devolved governments because I've mentioned Wales a couple of times. I don't think there's anything beneficial about Brexit, but certainly one thing that has been positive in, in the last period has been working with Wales and, and to some extent with Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland administration hasn't been in, in operation for most of the time that we've been doing this. But um, you know, Mark Drake, who is the current Welsh First Minister, who was my counterpart on the Joint Ministerial Committee for a period of time, um, he, um, he and I work very closely on a whole range of things, and I work closely with his successor, Jeremy Miles, and that has been positive and productive, and we'll continue to do so. And we do it on the basis of a different constitutional approach, too, because, you know, I'm a nationalist, I believe in independence, Wales has a, a, a Labour government with one Liberal minister in it, and, and actually one ex-Pride minister in it, but a Labour government which does not believe in independence. But we've, we've operated on the basis very explicitly, Mark and I agreed early on, that, you know, we were on the same journey, but we had a different destination and, uh, you know, we would find ways to work together and that's what we've done. Thanks, sir. Uh, very, very much. I think one of the interesting things here with the internal market bill is that there's a presumption there in the white paper and the legislation that, uh, that only Scots law is guaranteed by uh, the Acts of Union and that in fact, not, nothing that Scots law has subsequently guaranteed or that guarantees as a secondary effect to Scots law is covered by, the, by, uh, by that guarantee, which is a very interesting interpretation that has led to the situations you've outlined. Um, I think there, there are uh, a couple left. I think one of the, Mare Divine, would, uh, we're just wrapping up. So anyone who wants to, um, to actually get in a question now, please get it in now. Uh, so there's one from Mary Divine on mm -hmm. would the government, you can see that perhaps in front of you, uh, but yeah. just the audience, would you, would you be prepared to look at a non-political group who would give power of critique to the public debate over the transition to independence, given there'll be pain as well as gain? Well, in, in theory, nobody would object to that. In practice, where would you find these, these, these people who are untainted by the debate in, in one way or another? I, I think there, there is a place for respected figures, um, you know, a range of respected figures to give their views. But we live in such a partisan society, it's really, really difficult to see how this would operate in any sensible way. Um, I, I'm never going to reject the idea that there should be impartial critique of anything. I think that's, I mean, one of the things I've, I've done as a minister consistently over, over the years is bring into advice giving in government and consideration in government, academics, for example, from a range of, of, of universities and organizations, and actually from a range of countries. We've had some tremendous help uh, from, from outside Scotland, uh, and it's been very useful. And I always thought that's just what we would do and then I discovered it was comparatively unusual. It didn't happen in other places, even, even in Ireland. So I'm not against it, but I'm skeptical that we could find those, um, those men and women. Uh, I, I think it would be difficult to do. We've had a very, very good uh, group that Anton has chaired, the, the, the Standing Council on Europe. And, and that's perhaps as close as we've ever got to it, but it's operated um, in terms of advice giving rather than publication. And that may well have been its strength. Yeah, so I think we've now, uh, we're I, I now at half past six and we've covered all the, at least one question from uh, everybody on the topics connected, who made the question on the topics connected with your talk this evening. So uh, uh, I'll just, at this point, give my own personal thanks to you, Michael's Cabinet Secretary, and to, uh, and to uh, the principal and, every, and everyone here for turning up and then ask and the principal for introducing you, and to uh, ask uh, Desmond Nalte to close for Policy Scotland. Thanks very much, Murray. Um, I mean, as you said, I think we've actually had a great session, um, wonderful questions, and, and of course, great responses from, from, from Michael. Um, I'm sure he's intent on provoking agreement as well as disagreement. I think that's part of the commitment to democracy and, 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 and voices that he, he, he's put forward. Um, so can we, on behalf of all the audience, everyone who's been here, 
Um, thank our speakers, thank Anton Muscatelli for, for introducing, thank Murray for chairing, and in particular, thank Michael Russell for, 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 for joining us. I hope everybody's enjoyed it and found it illuminating, and I'm sure we'll have many future discussions on, on these topics because th they're not going away anywhere. So thank you very much to everyone for coming thank along. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good. Thank you.